the royal maxim, the last one I left with you when we were taping, that the simple survive and the complex flourish. That is not, as you might imagine, at least you might imagine I'm about to say, is not as simple as it sounds. I like the term since I made it up. And uh, if I can lead you to see in the general direction that it's headed, I think that some of you will like the reality behind the mere words. So let me redefine, it makes sense in the city, that just at the immediate hearing, anybody, ordinary intelligence, could take that without even hearing me talk on it. But even if they'd heard me talk just a little bit, they could nod right along their agreement that the simple do survive. I guess they might even take it as being a version of wherever it came from. I was about to blame it on the Old Testament, but it wasn't them. Maybe it was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> he always looked like he came from the Old Testament. But the old idea that God must have loved the common man because he made so many, many <laughs> of him. So even city people, ordinary intelligence, might say that what I said had real validity that the simple do survive. The common folks continue on the complex flourish. That is, the educated, the sophisticated, the clever, etc. So, as always, in the city it would make sense. But out in the bushes, no, 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 that's just child's play. So, let me redefine the terms. Let me properly define the terms for you. The simple, in this case, are simply what they are. That's the simple. And you can be educated, you can be sophisticated, you can be rich, you can be clever. But if you are simply what you are, then you're the simple, and you've got no future. You've got no hope for change. You have no hope, and you have no future. But get ready. I guess I'll go off on a side one, as long as I brought it up tonight. Let me, read, let me point out to you that that is a definition of the future. If you've got no future, you got no chance to change. What else is the future? Now we can't talk about, from a revolutionary sense, simply the sensation of external time, because then you can say, well, everybody's got a future. If I live another 10 years, then that 10 years is my future. But you've got no future if nothing is going to change, if everything is going to stay just as it is, and all you do is develop a bigger punch, more lines, less hair, a nastier attitude, Less sex drive. I guess that's all depressing enough, isn't it? You can call that your future. But in a sense of being a future, if there is no hope, that is no hope for change, then you've got no future. The simple have no future. If you are simply what you are, if you are simply what you are, you are simple. You'll survive. You may go ahead and fit into the right matrix in the uh, actuary tables and you may survive but you've got no future now let me define the complex those who are properly complex in the revolutionist sense are not simply complicated entangled are uselessly engaged that is not being complex in the revolutionist sense. It would be more like this, that in your thinking, in your life even, but specifically in your thinking, you would be direct, you would be elemental, and you would be unrattled. That would be being revolutionarily complex, if there was such a word as revolutionarily. Being merely, from some observable view, being merely complicated, being merely entangled in all sorts of apparent opinions, theories, beliefs, is not the complexity of which I speak. That kind of complexity 
almost sounds as though it's its own opposite because it is a kind of thinking. And if I had time and inclination, I could say it's not only your thinking, it's the way that you live. But at least in your thinking, it is direct. Now, it may sound as though I'm about to use the word simple, because I'm sure somewhere you would find direct as being a synonym, in somebody's opinion, for simple. But this is one of the cases that the words are almost taking on, the reality behind the words, a switch in meaning. That what the city, what ordinary intelligence would call simple, if it could be taken around the corner, if it could be taken up a level, then that would be the complex. Because as opposed to being what you are, that is what you're born being, this kind of complexity you can look at and you're not uselessly complicated. You're not uselessly entangled. That is, in thinking about what you're seeing, in thinking about what you're thinking. It is more, some of the Eastern writers, after it got translated, used to like to talk about the ultimate purpose of Zen which I'll go ahead and since I gave them credit, I will use their line, that some of them tried to talk about the direct perception of reality, which nowadays I would not be that crude to try and bore you with whatever reality seems to be because I've already pointed out to you that there are at least two. You see, they didn't understand that. Well, they understood that there were two to them. They thought there was the messed up reality, the real complicated, and they referred to that sort of thing in the East as being illusions. And then they thought there's the other reality. But they don't know that there's two realities going in the door, two realities coming out the door. So you, all you know that for now, that there is the verbal reality, and then there's the <laughs> there's that other reality. But there would be some validity if they were taking that into consideration, is why I even brought it up. Well, that would, of course, kill time. But to bring it up, that the kind of complexity I'm talking about, you are not burdened, you are not captured by, in your thinking, the kinds of useless entanglements that, well, in the city, oftentimes it goes under the such headings as concentrating, studying, thinking about. But if intelligence worked, is everyone from poets to some psychologists to ordinary people sometimes like to think about intelligence, if it actually worked, just almost at a minimal level, shouldn't intelligence be some sort of light, some sort of perception that you would turn on something and have some knowledge of it? Is the purpose of intelligence to be confused? Is the purpose of intelligence to be dumb? Now, if you're from the city, don't answer that. Don't send me any postcards or letters if you live in the city because I know what your answer is. But if intelligence had some transcendental potential, and all such activity as this is not some sort of misdirected hobby, then it does not intelligence, does it not just su suggest itself to you that intelligence somewhere has to have a potential operating mode that is beyond saying, well, all right, I'm intelligent enough to, to know this that I don't know what's going on. I'm intelligent enough, somebody else says, I'm intelligent enough to know this. I'm very confused. <laughs> or someone else, almost large segments of humanity have said this, that, all right, we're intelligent, and we are intelligent enough, even institutions, organizations, disciplines, we're intelligent, and we're intelligent enough to know this that we do not yet possess the intelligence to tell whether we know what we're talking about. <laughs> In the city, all of that <coughs> is quite all right. But does that suggest to you that something is lacking? Or do you think that the future is infinite? Do you think that you, that is your neural structure, is going to finally play out that little imaginary scenario of enough monkeys and enough typewriters finally retapping all of Shakespeare's works. Do you think that if you live long enough that your neural patterns not only will fire but misfire? You can hit yourself every now and then, take a few drinks, take a few tokes, and finally, just almost accidentally, 
or as they say in the South, the law of averages will catch up with you like the monkeys and the typewriters, and you will finally get intelligent and not really know why. <laughs> that, yeah, I was dumb for X amount of decades, but hell, then I got intelligent. <laughs> There is a kind of direct thinking that I was calling the complex, but in a real sense it is simplistic compared to the kind of intellectual, that is the kind of neurological, the physical activities of your brain, the kind of baggage that makes everyone else, I want you to hear this, it's not all that complicated tonight. It's almost too simple. That makes everyone else from Einstein's to important, intelligent people, leaders of intellectual, academic, political, economic communities will sit and discuss things. Go off to foreign places like Reno and Lake Tahoe to hold conventions and read papers and as one man reads his paper, pointing out, after they introduce him for five minutes and all of his degrees and everything he's written before, then he reads his paper for 50 minutes, pointing out, of course, you're the tacit part being how intelligent he is to even be there, but pointing out that we're reaching new areas in which intelligence is failing us again. And all of the other learned, his peers sit there and go, my, my, the man is intelligent. Who else but intelligent? One of us would admit that he doesn't know it all. That kind of march of progress, if they won't call it that, it's not quite up to John Philip Sousa's <laughs> middle of the road stuff, but if they want to call that kind of you know, march of progress, it is true that eventually things do move along. Now, I've told you that. You were the first, I was the first one you ever heard prove to you people the right kind of thinking that things are progressing. But as far as one individual, as far as what appears to be one lifetime, you have got to see, something's got to suggest itself to you that there is a serious matter lacking, not spiritual, not psychological. It's electrical, it's chemical, it is your brain itself, that something is lacking and no one notices it to take intelligence in any way to be some lack of intelligence. That our intelligence is proved by admission that we are not totally intelligent. That I'll tell you one more time, although the city does not need my acquisition of this, I was going to say that all that is well and good in the city, all right? But are you going to put up with that? You can't put up with that and do this. You won't live long enough to put up with that. There is a kind of complex simplicity, and let me see if I can draw a few more pictures since it's so simple to try and distract you. I did point out that as opposed to a kind of useless thinking that was complicated, uh, intertwined, Byzantine, that this kind of thinking would be direct, elemental, and non-rattled. I bet you didn't know. I wonder if anybody wondered what I was going to do with that. Here I go. Non-rattled. You've all heard the term, don't rattle somebody's cage. I would assume that came from animals and somebody telling passers-by at a circus or a carnival is don't go up and be rattling the cage of a tiger or any animal if you had that much decency, but probably at least for the safety of somebody, if a lion's laying there minding his own business, you can get close enough, is don't go up and rattle the cage. You could regret it. You got no business doing it. That was really what struck me while I was talking when I put in direct, elemental, and unrattled, because there is a way in which I could describe this kind of new intelligence in light of not having your cage rattled. But you recall last week, I gave you as my little non-religious 
gift, another definition of new intelligence. To be thinking without believing. Now, ordinary intelligence is thinking with believing, and it's a part of your own nervous system rattling the cage of intellect. <laughs> believing. Believing is relying on something without absolute proof. It is a conviction that something is true without such proof. Now it is used synonymously. You do it, life does it. The people use believe all the time with think with intelligence. But another area that we can't get into tonight, but someday, maybe I will, when I find out that all words have an evil twin. <laughs> and they normally pass as synonyms, but they're actually evil twins. <laughs> but belief, even the dictionary, belief is a conviction or relying upon something for which there is no absolute proof. I'm sure that I can already think, but there's got to be six or seven more uses and definitions of believe. But that is the one having to do with what would appear to be one's thinking processes, one's consciousness, the individual. You rely upon something to say, I believe that something is true. You rely upon it, and there's no absolute proof. I remember that much from the dictionary. No absolute proof. Now again, in the city, that sounds fine. Because in the city, even the those who pass are being learned, those who pass as being thinkers, will continually, at some expense to themselves, point out time and again that, all right, in my field, not just economics and weather forecasting, but in physics, in all sorts of areas, when someone apparently is pushing at the frontier of knowledge, they're going to point out that we do not yet, or I cannot offer you absolute proof but we believe, we believe, we believe. Now, that sounds fine at these conventions. But people run their life in that way. That's the way things run in the city. And the octane is high enough. The fuel, the conversion of energy is, a, is adequate in the city that it's passed along as being synonymous with some sort of knowing, with some sort of intelligence. And it is not. That's why I tried to draw the distinction with you verbally to get you to look in a certain direction that this kind of new intelligence, as I've been wont to call it a few times of late, would be like thinking without believing. See, the belief to say that you rely on something or you have a conviction that something is correct without absolute proof, that doesn't matter. It can be thinking without belief or it can be thinking without non-belief. Because if you got one, if you are letting one part of your nervous system rattle the cage and say that what we think has to do with what we believe, that there is some corollary, then if it can be based upon, if it can be made to believe that there is a belief that is in some way connected with what should be intelligence, then if you've got belief, you've got the viable potential for non-belief, and of course vice versa. That's a problem with all of dualities as far as the nervous system is concerned, because if you give egress to belief, if you let your own nervous system, if you let that kind of neural partnership within everyone that the nervous system apparently can talk to itself, that the brain apparently can talk to itself, it will rattle the cage of intelligence vis-a-vis -vis the whole notion of belief. Because it will take things, it will be convinced of things of which there is no absolute proof. In the city, that does not matter. But that is not intelligence. That is not actual thinking. Not in the revolutionist sense. It is not simply semantics. But because you spend your life, you and everyone else, that every time you stop in under ordinary conditions and believe that you're thinking about something, you're not doing anything. Not anything in the sense of this. It is as though the part of the nervous system that will take belief, that will take believing as being something worthwhile. And I'll tell you one more time, it's obvious, it should be to you, that under ordinary conditions, 
There's nothing wrong with this. Life moves along at its own pace that seems to be a kind of process of men beginning to believe something in different areas, and then apparently it picks up a certain kind of proof and becomes a fact. And it becomes almost irrelevant, it becomes part of the background. And some new cartoon figures are drawn in, and there seems to be an expansion, there seems to be a moving, and then there's new beliefs. I know they're sometimes called theories and etc. But outside the hard sciences, people saying, I believe. People have been saying that we know of three or four thousand years, saying, I believe that we should treat our fellow man as ourselves. Not just that I read that in some religious book because I'm not that religious, but I believe that. Something in me tells me that. It's one part of your nervous system rattling the cage of the part that should be thinking and gets it involved with thoughts being connected to belief. That is, intelligence being connected to non-intelligence. That is what you know now being connected with that which you've got no real proof. And to think, I said this was going to be simple. <laughs> well, to think, I thought it was going to be simple. If the use of intelligence is in any way connected to believing, let me go back to this. I've been through this before, and most of you have gotten some glimpse of this. Maybe you just thought I've changed, by changing the words, you missed it. In the ordinary sense of anything, if you rely upon one part of a combination, whether we're talking about good and evil, up and down, right and wrong, moral and immoral, believing or not believing, that is, relying on something for which there is no absolute proof, or denying something for the reason that there is no absolute proof. If you are basing, if you are tied into either one of the dualities, you're tied to both of them. Because it doesn't matter that you say, well, sometimes I probably let what I believe, that is, things that I don't, do not, I can say that I have absolute proof for, and I do let it probably color what I call thinking. But then at other times, I'll stop it when it goes too far. You can't stop it. You're trying to jump in the water, and you're going to say, I'm going to get a little wet. I'm going to jump in the water, but I'll only get wet on my left side. I'll submerge, yeah, I'll jump in, but only this side counts. I want to get wet here. It's impossible. If you will buy a part of the story, if you will rely on it partially, you've got to rely on all of it that the other side of it is always potentially true for you. You are then dealing with what would appear to be a proper use of the highest end of the nervous system, and you are not. Now there's a way I could point this out. To go back to my artificial <coughs> but not unfair description of man being cut up into like three different stages. The nervous system has three general areas that overlap internal one another but can be divided up for the sake of observation and map making temporarily into his physical activities, all of the observable motor activities, the body itself in motion in 3D space. Then what everybody calls his emotional life. And then the highest end of the nervous system right now is intellectual life. And on that basis, I can point this out, that you can be physical. You can do physical things without being intelligent about it, without thinking about it. In many cases, it's the most efficient. But the thing is, you can be physical. You individually can be physically involved with something right now, or somebody can be almost entirely physical in their activity in life. You can do that with almost no intelligence. You can be emotional with almost no intelligence. But you cannot be intelligent without intelligence. <laughs> See, even you saw that for a second. So now I refer you back. How are you going to mix in non-intelligence with intelligence and say, well, I'm intelligent? Or to say, well, I'm thinking about it. No, you're not. You think you're thinking about it, and you're thinking about it in the city sense. But to let in belief, that is, well, there are things that I'm either convinced of, I have a conviction about it, I can feel it, 
or I think this about covers the spectrum that the dictionary would support me. If it doesn't, the hell of the dictionary. All the way from you can rely on something to you are convinced of something. You will have a conviction about it. But all across this possible spectrum, all of this is without absolute proof. To take that and to believe that that in any way is connected to, supportive of, is agreeable to knowing something, you're an idiot. You may be a city thinker, but you're an idiot. You got an idiot locked in the attic. And you don't even know how to let it, well, you don't even know he's in there, much less. I was going to say you don't know how to let him out. You don't even know he's in there. You holler out, are you an idiot up there? And the guy says, are you kidding? <laughs> it's me. And you go, oh, that's right, me, yeah. Oh. <laughs> of course, as a real aside, if that's you, why the hell you got him locked in there? Why don't you turn him loose? <laughs> to carry this much further, if you tried to turn him loose, if you knew how, then you'd have another question that you'd have to answer, is he won't come out. <laughs> if you could say, all right, the door is open, you can leave now. <laughs> he won't go anywhere. <laughs> the complexity that I was talking about that is necessary for one to flourish while the simple can survive. That is people, the vast, 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 almost everybody. Forget me vasting it all up for the majority. Almost everybody, almost, almost, almost everybody, just a handful of people might do otherwise. Everybody else is going to survive. The simple will survive. And the simple are simply those who cannot change. That's being simple. They cannot change and they've got no future. The complex almost would sound like the simple that the complex in their thinking are not encumbered by the rattling of the cage of the other part of your nervous system that will deal in things that are not known. Well, yeah, they're not maybe known, but I'm almost sure they're true. <laughs> Welcome back to the city. Well, I'm convinced they're true. I don't know about that. Now, you might try to twist my words around. I'm not going to get in a debate with you. But I don't know, in my heart, in my soul, which, you know, that's enough, but <laughs> when somebody starts that, in my soul, there is a, I'm, I'm convinced that that's true. That's fine. I certainly am not going to argue with that in life because I see the purpose. It's easy to see. Why well, it's necessary. But that has nothing to do even with the strict definition of intelligence in the city. And it has nothing to do with the intelligence I'm talking about. Well, that's your, the rest of your life, assuming that you're still fooling around with whatever I'm doing. It's like me trying to whip you on, trying to encourage you, trying to trick you, trying to tr tickle you about going over here, and you're dragging this ungodly noise, this breathing right offshore, it's thrashing around. <laughs> Have you ever been up to the Outer Banks of North Carolina? Well, there's some parts of New Jersey Especially get into, I don't know, it seems like when fall gets in good and on dark nights and you got down deserted parts of beaches is what Cairo, the story he was retelling. And there's some people that that one beach in the city, they say on nights like that, when it's so dark you can't really see, but you, they can just feel that it's not far unless you couldn't hear it. But it's something gigantic out there, and you can't see it, but it's close enough, and the thing is thrashing about, and it's breathing real heavy. <laughs> Imagine, just sweeping through the beaches, you can hear it above the breaking of the waves. <laughs> Anybody see a connection? <laughs> You can't deal in belief about it. Well, how about the many times, especially people that in some way brush against some of these tapes or somebody just heard me casually talking, this was open to the public. Uh, it'd certainly be 
predictable that many people in the city would, regardless of my caveats, would uh, conclude that I was some kind of social or psychological critic of humanity, and that you can't be so harsh on humanity or that I'm anti-religious or I'm anti-sociable, that I apparently keep trying to kick in the private parts of people all of the good, humane, sentimental, decent, maudlin, whining feelings of people <laughs> that uh, I apparently would have if they heard me talk for a while, I guess they could conclude that I had almost no faith in faith. <laughs> and then, of course, after that, they might conclude that I had no belief in belief and that people in the city, as life would make them do, would say, you cannot live like that. And, of course, in the city, they're correct. People cannot live like that. But you have got to have beliefs. You've got to have faith. You've got to have hope, and et cetera. That is not intelligence. It's not that it's worse than intelligence. It's not that I'm saying you can't have it. But it is not intelligence. Anything less than intelligence is not intelligence. Anything less than knowing something is not knowing something. It's only in the city that you can say, well, I sort of know it, and people go, well, congratulations, give that, <laughs> give that man a degree. Promote him. In the bushes, that won't fly. There's nobody in the bushes to say, hey, that's great. And you say, I'm just beginning to realize how dumb I am. You know, if you're waiting around in the bushes, if you find a revolutionist camp somewhere, and you're waiting for them to come up and give you a sash and a kiss on the cheek and a medal, well, you're going to be there a long time standing. <laughs> They'll make you officer of the day. <laughs> Maybe of the year. Permanent latrine, orderly. <laughs> this is a great place since I was bringing up certain city attitudes and views that can be taken. Let me give you an absolute prime example. And I've talked around the edges of this many times, but here is just primo. The historic, non-stop, sometimes it's looked at as a philosophical question, but ordinary people outside the world of academia have been caught up in this in various ways. But to give it a kind of strict, easily describable coat, I can take the kind of philosophical sketch of it, that is that thinkers throughout the known history of man have pointed out a very serious problem, and that is the difference or the ability for men to differentiate between the truth and falsehood. And people have turned this inside out, they've done it apparently in logical ways. They have done it in ways that apparently were a little more loose. They began to approach, at times they considered to be spiritual intrigues between man's ability or the lack of it to divine between the true and the falsehood. It now comes into play in psychological terms that perhaps our senses even can delude us. There is simply this, whether you're a philosopher or not, if you're just fairly in the city sense, intelligent. You would agree, if you're going to pass for being intelligent at a great intelligent cocktail party, that if someone brought up the notion that it may be impossible, it's certainly uncertain that any human can correctly divine the truth from falsehood. Now, anybody that's passed for intelligent for 4,000 years would go, that's true. That is, a, that is a sticky, if not thorny question. You know why? <laughs> that's such an apparently difficult question that even the leading thinkers of any age, from the Hindu philosophers to the Greeks, right up until today, you know why that question, the reason that it seems so uncertain, if not impossible, for man to tell the truth from the falsehoods? 
because there is no difference. <laughs> they've had four, as us historians say, they, they've had four fucking thousand years of the people that pass for intelligence. I mean the kind of people that you can read and for entertainment, philosophers that can be interesting and they can go on for whole books, they can make whole careers. All philosophers in a tight always fall back on that one. The thing is, say, well, my, the first 10 years and my last 10 years of my books, once their sales begin to go down, their tenure begins to get shaky, they can always fall back on this. About, well, for the last, my first three books, in this previous 10 years that I've spent here at Princeton or Heidelberg, I gained a certain re repute. My books have sold. Even ordinary people in the street have discussed my name. But now I've got to tell you, even I, one of the world's great recognized German thinkers of the day, <laughs> even I would now have to admit, I am not as certain as I was 10 years ago that even I, much less everybody, but that man himself has the unconditional ability under all conditions to divine, to separate the truth, reality, from the non-truth, non-reality. They still will fall back on that. And nobody can look directly at it. I was talking about the kind of complexity of thinking that makes certain people flourish, that makes your thinking flourish at least, that the reason that they start off and say, well, maybe it's uncertain we can, then they find a conclude if pushed, all right, it's probably impossible because who can prove it? Whether we're actually telling the truth and the false because we've got no outside objective, somebody or something to tell us, so how will we ever know? Blah, 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 <laughs> dot, 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 <laughs> infinity, tenure saved, new book coming out. But no one has ever been able in the city to simply look at the reason that it seems to be impossible to tell the difference is there ain't no fucking difference. Is that a kind of, I would say, just exhilarating, convoluted pristinity, if there is such a word. <laughs> is that not it? Is that not the kind of complexity I was trying to talk about, a kind of direct, complex simplicity? And of course, a bunch of you laughed, and you may not think about it again until I try and run you in that direction again, but there is an example. Everybody from priests, theologians, philosophers, why is it that we, we, we're not sure whether we can tell the truth from the false? but we can't be sure that we're sure or not sure. <laughs> How complex, they would say this is. Complex. <laughs> the reason they can't tell the difference is there is no difference. <laughs> then they would say, well, I don't know whether I believe that. <laughs> we gotta turn the tape over. Well, we don't have to turn the tape over. <laughs> but we'll try and be truthful. gets down into the blood and guts of humanity, and I was going to try to spread out, so I'm not going to stay here long, but let me back up one more time about the rattling of the cage. What you're dealing with, again, is in humans that pass for being conscious, and nowadays it's most of the humans on this earth. Your nervous system has got two parts that you can, that anybody can, become aware of, which is the basis of all the ideas of dreams of gods to spirits talking to you, to intuition, to the subconscious mind, that there is within you the ability evidently, of, well not evidently, to you it's true, of one thing to talk and something else to listen. That is, you can apparently talk to yourself. All right. That's what I refer to sometimes as two voices of the higher end of the nervous system. We're talking about up in the brain itself, what ordinary people call intelligence, the mental life of men. One of those potential speakers 
rattles the cage of the other one. And it does it on the basis that it tries to, now I'm just using these words, they've got no moral, they've got no qualitative inference. Except in the city, if you, that's all you listen to the city ears, everything is weighted, right? But there's not. But it's as though one part of the nervous system tempts, torments, challenges, tries to chart the other part on the basis of, well, do we believe this? And let me give you credit, or the example I'm making up, that this one person I'm using as an example, that the other part of the nervous system is trying this down just to actually think. <laughs> and then you've got the other part that's rattling his cage all the time. <laughs> that, hey, do we actually believe this? And this other part's trying to think. <laughs> like, well, damn it, shut up. And of course, <laughs> an ordinary person can't do that. This is, wait a minute. The kind of things you're thinking about now, that goes against our beliefs. <laughs> no, wait a minute. You're acting as though that has absolute proof. And everything that I'm involved with does not lead me to believe there's absolute proof for anything. And so you've got the one part giving you credit. This example, my fictitious man, giving the person credit is trying to actually think, trying to actually make the nervous system operate, even at ordinary levels, at optimum efficiency. But it's having the other part of the nervous system, the other part of the brain that can talk, is continually rattling on its cage and beating a stick between the bars and doing everything from tormenting it, telling it's not true, tempting it, well, how, how can you prove that to me? To the part that deals in belief, nothing can be proven. Or it wouldn't be dealing in belief because it will accept, and in fact, sometimes be con convinced and rely on things for which there is no absolute proof, and that part will admit it. At times, brag about it. And so then it tempts the other part, rattles the cage about, oh, wait a minute, I hear what you're thinking over there. Prove it. It's not a matter that the other part can't prove it. It's a matter that one part does not deal in proof. It deals in belief. And that's not thinking, not in the bushes. That's why I told you this new intelligence you can look at as being thinking without belief. It's not a conviction that what you're thinking in the city sense is true or false. Which right there is, I guess, an atomic oxymoron. Because <laughs> anybody from the city listening to me by now, I can speak for them. They'd say, well, listen, this has gone far enough. He makes Zen puzzles sound straightforward. It's <laughs> that so what you're thinking is not based upon from the other view, that is the lower part, the belief part of your nervous system in the brain, about, wait a minute, is there absolute proof or not proof? To really be intelligent in the sense I mean, you would be thinking, and it's got no corollary to belief. It's not yes or no, right or wrong, it's just you don't have a connection. You're thinking without belief being connected to this process. If the intellect that I'm talking about that could be complex enough, that could be elemental and direct, that you simply look at things and you don't get rattled. If that was an operation, then what you believe, what seems to be, to use ordinary terms and pictures, your sad background, whatever it may have been, traumas in your life, the beliefs of your apparent culture, religion, your family, all the bruises, all the subconscious motivations and hindrances that you picked up, all of that would be nothing. Well, it's background noise. Mm -hmm. But then you could do the kinds of things that people dream that some of these characters in history have done. And I assume that you assume what this should be headed toward. That you can simply look at things and you see information. You see things other people doesn't see. It's not a basis, as I said, of secret knowledge. I mean, it's there. It's not secret. It's just nobody can see it. You're not supposed to see it. You're supposed to discuss it. <laughs> You're supposed to think about it. You're supposed to talk about it. You're supposed to weigh the pros and the cons. It's just a hobby. In the city, out in the bushes, thinking is not a hobby. It's a way of life. Real thought. New thought.
in me turning the simple into the complex and vice versa. Let me give you another one. How about, for good alliteration, an audio philopic <laughs> illusion. The AAA. I knew it would all end up there. Well, that's the AA. <laughs> Is there a connection between the AA and the AAA? <laughs> I guess according to how much you like to get drunk and get in your car, right? So. <laughs> At any rate, an, an audio philopic, <coughs> since I made up the word, I'll tell you what it means, I guess. Illusion. <laughs> the reproduction of music under at-home commercial conditions. This is not anything technical, but other than the medium itself, or what seems to be, I guess, the software. Let's say you got a CD player. Everybody knows what that is. You got your little CD player. All right, other than that, that's the source. Then you got the playback equipment. Besides the speakers, next thing you got is the amp and the preamp. But let's say the amp. That's the main thing. You got to convert these signals, you got to amplify them, and then it turns into music. All right, as most of you probably know, either you got equipment at home or you've read enough about it. Nowadays, it's most common that there are all sorts of outboard equipment, add-ons, EQs being the great one, most popular one, uh, equalizers, the things with little slides, and you can pick out certain areas of the audio spectrum, you can make one louder, you can drop it down. There are expanders and compressors that out of your amp, if you look at home, you got, if you don't have uh, one that's got the preamp going out in the back, anyway, in your tape loop, you can plug in all kinds of things, surround sound now, add on other speakers, and it'll delay the sound. You can have all kinds of fancy equipment, you can spend easily, nowadays, another three or four thousand dollars of things that just, it takes this, and it runs it through these other kinds of processors, is what they're mainly known as. And then it will amplify it out to where you can hear it and turn it into audible sound. All right. There are people who save up their money. There are people who keep adding on equipment, more and more of things to process the sound, ostensibly, mm -hmm. to make it more lifelike. Now you have, as in every field, a, a bunch of nuts. In this particular field, they're known as audiophiles. <laughs> now, as you might suspect, since I'm saying you that nowadays it's common that just bricklayers and people, if they get a few bucks and they like to play music loud, they're going to get around. Somebody's going to sell them. <laughs> Even at Kmart, they probably got them. But now, a little $100 equalizer. And to show them that and all they got to do is listen, and it does make it sound different. In fact, they can make it sound better from some view. And so you got people, ordinary people now, adding on the outboard equipment to further process the sound. So as you might su suspect, some of you already left, these nuts in the, this particular field known as audiophiles, they go where? Not to Kmart, the opposite direction. Yeah. In fact, I'm not gonna stay here much longer. In fact, you people, if you just got a cheap, if you got a $99 whole little stereo thing that you bought at Reed Drugstore or a and <laughs> almost all of them will have tone controls even that says bass, in trouble, at least, to where you can turn it up. And apparently, it sounds like that the highs are a little brighter, which is another story out of those $99 things. But anyway, it kind of seems that way. <laughs> or you can turn the bass over. All right, the audio files would say, to hell with even that. And, if, and almost everything's got it, even expensive equipment. They'll take them and set them all at zero. Their story is that the sound should come out as God intended it. <laughs> I, I'm getting to where I was going to go with this. <laughs> that it should not be fed through all this process. There's a term been hanging around that I know of for at least a couple of decades, or a decade, that to an audiophile, <coughs> since you've got to have the software, in other words, you've got to have either a tape or a CD or a record, so you've got to have that. But after that, when it comes to actually reproducing the sound, the heart of it, what you're really dealing with is an amplifier. 
in their case, they've already forgotten all the EQs and the compressors and the expanders and all that and the reverbs. To them, and this is not going to be technical, just trust me a second. They say that all you need, what would be the epitome, which is literally impossible, but they say that the dream of the ultimate amp would be a straight wire with gain. Yeah. Right. Now I'm not, now I'm not in an expert in electronics, but I understand this much. I know what it means. Is instead of this going in here and even having to run through different stages and be amplified, a straight wire means that's their dream of an amp. Because anytime you run through other equipment, you're adding distortion, whether you hear it or not. The audio files don't care whether you can hear it or not. That's, <laughs> that's the point about being a fanatic in some field. They don't care. It's just a known fact. <laughs> An additional inch of wire running to your speakers adds some resistance and hence some distortion to the original God intended sound. <laughs> and so their dream is a real amp would be a straight wire. That is, if that would actually act like a transformer and actually build, actually amplify. And gain is, they mean, had a volume. In other words, you could send the sound right out of here and instead of going in this big old huge box. A little small box, but anyway, if you ever looked in an app, it's got all kinds of crap in there. <laughs> they say what it would be, the ultimate app would be a straight wire with a volume control. <laughs> if it would work. See, that's the point. But intellectually, they are picturing paradise for them. Because then you would have the minimum of distortion possible. But you understand that I explained enough, it's literally impossible, a straight wire. If you hooked up a volume control, it wouldn't do anything. A straight wire will not amplify. A straight wire will not operate like an amplifier, but kind of theoretically, it could, except it won't. <laughs> but they have been able to describe paradise, heaven, the epitome. A straight wire with gain, a straight wire with a volume control would be it. No tone controls, no equalizers, no expanders. The sound comes right out of here like God intended. Of course, they can't ever get into what happened in the studio and the mixing and, you know, you can't, you can't fool around somebody's hobby or you ruin it. But from here, it's like the sound was perfect. And after that, instead of getting down here to get complicated, the ultimate, the dream would be a straight wire with a volume knob, a straight wire with a gain. All right. Whew. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no. Here's what I was going to point out. Can you see that in a sense, when I was going to make this an audio philophic illusion, <laughs> that the kind of complex thinking I am talking about would be a kind of direct lean, a straight wire, lean out of debt debt-free intelligence. That kind of intelligence would be a straight wire with gain. No distortion. No, at a minimum of distortion. Almost no distortion. No crosstalk in there. That's a term of the music picking up noise from some of the components and fluorescent lights and from the AC line that the music comes out pure. The thinking comes out pure. That you're not dealing with beliefs, you're not dealing with all of the apparent noise, distortion that everyone else, everyone is dealing with in the nervous system. Their nervous system, the brain itself, is serving in its own way the same kind of purpose and producing the same kinds of problems to these nut audiophiles that the world's best out. In case you people don't know it, there are amplifiers made that cost $10,000 for home use. Little thing you can pick up. I mean, you can buy one at you know, a different type of radio shack for 100 bucks. But they make amps like that, and they still put out noise. You can't hear it, but they can measure it. <laughs> then whatever goes in, the input of the amp does not come out exactly as it went in. What goes in ordinary intelligence through the senses? Let's take an easy one, through the eyes. Well, well, all the senses, you understand, come into play, but there you are looking at somebody. A group of people doing something. Two people engaged in some dance. Somebody talking to you, and you look at them, and it goes in, 
and it does not register in the same way if this could be proven and measured. It does not play in your intelligence, in your thinking, the same way that it came in. It gets distorted to some degree. There's this kind of crosstalk, this kind of noise that is added. The kind of intelligence I'm talking about is almost a straight wire with gain. Uh, well, how about this? A lot of you have gotten used to it. Uh, my continual use, overuse, since it begins to be self-defeating, of profanity, silly examples, uh, taking surprising turns in things I'm saying, saying the unexpected, when it sounds like I'm setting up a cliché. <coughs> Can any of you see that in a sense there is a purpose behind that? Well, it's not a fair question, is it? And at least a verbal assault on the nights we meet, and then it's a little beyond that, but at least on the surface of verbal assault, is to try and disavow you, to try and do everything, if it would work, to shame you, to make you laugh, to such a way that you almost lose that kind of electronic fat. <laughs> that you almost become a person, now this sounds bad in the city, this would be a pejorative term, but you almost become, as far as thinking, a person with no what? Beliefs! That is, no noise, no distortion. What does belief, that is, lack of absolute proof, have to do with thinking? Assuming that you are doing it right, or trying to think right. It has nothing. What does the noise that every out, you plug it in the wall, the AC line, by its very nature, has noise. And the audio files know it. I can't hear it, but it's there. And of course it does have an effect. That is the same thing as having belief. In a sense. I'm not trying to, of course, make you atheist, because to make you an atheist would be almost as bad as making you a Baptist. Or a Christian or a Jew and blah, blah, blah. That's not the point. But belief, anything less than actual knowledge, has got no place dancing with knowledge. As far as thinking, you should almost be stripped. You should be ready for combat. You should not be carrying around a bunch of crap. You shouldn't have a backpack. You should be dressed, almost stripped. And what you got to carry with you? How much shit should you have? How much junk should you have? How much junk you got to have? Now people think they got to have a whole bunch of junk to live in the city to be happy. I got to have stuff, which is all right. I don't care. What does stuff, what does carrying around stuff have to do with doing this? Now you understand now, don't you? I ain't talking about stuff. Of course, if stuff has got you, I'm talking about stuff. But it's the stuff of trying to think, trying to find the way to think that I'm talking about, when you cannot actually think directly about it. You got all this stuff. You got all this stuff that you think you're believing or not believing about what you're trying to think about. Now, I regret that I was not here first for the term, because I'm sure I've heard it somewhere like in a cheap movie. But I'll go ahead and say it because it has such a nice ring. That you should, in an intellectual sense, be that kind of lean, mean fighting machine. That's what it would be. Almost a straight wire with gain. That's you. If any of you, or some of you, have been around this close enough that you know what I'm talking about, but there is a kind of lightness to it, there is a kind of directness to it, and it is not inappropriate for me to say that in a sense you lose a whole lot of intellectual fat. It's not a continual wrestling around and trying to shift your weight and get your gut above your pants and to try to think, to try and think, well, listen, some of the things he talks about I can almost think about, but then, and then what you're saying is, then I got to dance with my own fat, then I got to... I don't know, I've had ideas before, I've thought about this, and I'm not sure I believe all that. 
I never ask you to believe anything. I got nothing to tell you to believe. I don't believe shit. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. I don't even believe this. Because if you believe this, then you can disbelieve it. Then you have some doubt about it. Of course, I'm not doing it the way that which you'd be doing it now by trying to do it. You just cannot believe it. I mean, if you're going to believe it, then you're going to disbelieve it. Maybe not that same part, but that doesn't matter. If you're going to believe part of it, then you have set yourself up. It is a debt that's got to be paid. You can't take gifts from the city. Don't let them pin medals on you. Don't let them give you anything. Because if you believe one thing, then you'll believe something else. If you believe any part of this, which I've told you, don't. But if you believe some part of this, then some part of it, there's no way out. None. Mathematically, it's impossible. If you believe something, I tell you, then other parts, almost equal, if you live long enough, it'll balance out. Equally, there'll be parts you don't believe. And of course, what will that produce? Nothing. <laughs> and you and I will have gone through this, if I let it keep going, X number of years, and I'll die. You go, well, that was very interesting. Huh. <laughs> You guys are going to bury him or have a party or anything? If not, i got to go. You know, you'll find something else. And whenever you think about it, you think, that was very interesting. But nothing will have happened. It will balance itself out. That part that does not believe will rattle the cage of the other part. And maybe someday you'll think about something I said or something will jog your memory and you'll think, I used to really, you know, I believed that he was on to something. But as soon as you say that, it's like you're dealing with an attorney. Try to ask an attorney a straight question. They say, well, yes. But on the other hand, that's what you're dealing with with belief. If you're going to believe one part of something, you're going to have to disbelieve some other part. There is no way out. That is not the kind of intelligence I'm talking about. Of course, again, I can say this to any of you get a hint of why it's almost impossible to even talk about this. Because if there's no way out, then even my descriptions of it are faulty. Well, I told you that. But they're the best I ever heard. <laughs> well, we got a few minutes, I guess. And I promised that I might tell you about something that I brought up. It was the great... I just said great. I can't prove that yet. ESR, which maybe will help some of you, if you need it, get a glimpse of something else, the way the nervous system is arranged, and I can give you examples that apparently have to do with behavior and man's psychological life and blah, blah, blah. This stands for exaggerated sense of range. And it is a specific way in which the nervous system, man's intelligence, believes it can do more than it does. And the reason I brought it up the last time we met and I brought up the term, I can say, which I've done, that people do not change. Of course, an idiot in the city can say that. What are you inferring? Never mind, we don't have time for that. <coughs> Enough monkeys with the typewriters would have finally written that sentence. But why is it that that is not common knowledge? Why is it even you can't remember it all the time? Why is it that some of you can't remember it hardly at all? Except I say it, and then some nights you think, I can almost believe that. <laughs> the brain tells itself, if it heard me say, or anybody say, people do not change. People are, of course, I've never put it this way, but if, they, if the ordinary intelligence heard somebody say, listen, people are absolute robots. People are born a certain way. They're genetically destined. They can't move. Oh, they may lose a few pounds. They may gain a few pounds. But what they are, personality-wise, people cannot change. They are born predestined. What they are is what they are, and it can't be changed. Ordinary people hear that. The nervous system, the mind itself, says that is not true. In the city, people, mind will go, 
I think about that. I've tried to give it some credence. I've tried to look at it from this way, but I cannot believe that. I have evidence in my own life to the contrary. I look around and I have evidence to the contrary. And what is it? It's ESR. It's an exaggerated sense of range. And here's the way it manifests itself. Nothing exotic or complicated here, but I just never put it to you in this way. That everybody can say this in response. Everybody can say this quite validly. They can say, that can't be true because I do not think the same way every day. I don't feel the same way every day. I don't feel the same way sometimes in the morning. I, I feel a certain way. My mental activities run along certain lines, but many times, uh, after a couple of hours and some coffee and I get to work and I get away from the, the house and I don't know, I get in a different environment, I'm a different person. And then some days I have to go out on calls, I have to go out and do service calls, and I can go out to a brand new location. And I do think different, like in a new environment. What you are saying, consciousness would be responding, about people being absolutely locked in and cannot change, can't do anything at all differently. Ordinary intelligence would say that is not true, and I've got the personal living proof otherwise. But it is a case of that um <laughs> E S R because all of what it just said is true enough but it is an exaggerated sense of range in this that ordinary city consciousness intelligence has no continuing sense of time that it does not operate in a continuing 4D environment and thus, it cannot take into consideration that although what it said seems valid, that I do not think the same way all of the time, I do not feel the same way all of the time, here's what it can't see. is Hey, that's true. Except that these particular times and circumstances are such, you do think the same thing all the time, but then it apparently the situation is different, and then you do think something differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I just said it. The range is limited, except what I was going to do last seven night, I don't... It's like you've got a couple of chords you can play. This is not important. I won't stay on it for those of you that don't. But it's like you can say, all right, I have... I, I feel like my life's in the key of E flat. But, um, but I don't only have a key of E flat, which is sort of my everyday key. That's, that's me when you see me mostly. I'm sort of a semi-happy-go-lucky guy. That's my E-flat. But I've got to admit, I'm going to tell you, many times I go to an A-flat minor because I do have a temper. People can push me too far, and I've got a short fuse, and so I've got da-da. <laughs> so i got that. So you're wrong. I am not locked in. I'm not one thing. i got those two chords, and I'll tell you something else. I've got... Sometimes I got like a, a G seventh chord that kind of moves you. It used to be known as a, I guess it still is, a passing chord. Like from, I'm fixing to go from E flat to A flat minor, which is, I got to admit, are my two predominant favorite keys. I don't know, that's just the way I am. But I even, <laughs> I even at times, I'm not really locked into just one of those. I'm sort of, if I was at the keyboard, sort of a G seven. And I'm probably, you know, it's very likely I'm about to slip into that A flat minor. I could drop back to the E flat. That all is valid to the nervous system, to the mind at that level, that its response to saying that it cannot move, that it cannot change, it can look around and say it's not true. Because during a one, during a 16 hour period, my waking hours in one day, I can be thinking a certain way, I can get all involved, something can make me mad, and I can go around for two or three hours talking to myself, fuming. Just caught up in this kind of negative ide fix. And then I can get over it. I can have a good laugh. I can go, to, I can go out and run. I can drop by the Y and take a swim. And I'm, I'm not thinking that way anymore. So what you said is not correct. 
But that is an exaggerated sense of range. Because it's just these two or three chords, and you play them over and over and over, but the intelligence cannot recognize it's the same chords over and over. It does recognize I've got a couple of chords in here. I've got a couple of modes of ways that I seem to be able to think. Because it doesn't say it that way. But all it's talking about is like a chord, or a mode, that I can think in this key, and it's, there it is, the one chord, and I can think up here in this chord, and I can feel in these two chords. But since there is no connecting, continuous awareness of time, it does not see that all I'm doing is repeating these two or three chords over and over and over and over. That is what gives what I was calling a, an exaggerated sense of range. This is not to prove that I'm correct. This is for you to use to realize that you yourself, everybody, every one of you, are still victim of some of this. I've just never put in these kind of words. You believe that there is a whole lot more to you than there is. <laughs> and I'm talking about a whole lot more. And not just if you could do the correct autopsy on yourself and look in there and see they ain't nothing but blood and guts and pretty yucky at that. Where, where is me? You see the blood? Yeah. You see the guts? Yeah. That's you. There's also a sense beyond that kind of perhaps too physical a description in what would appear to be this non-physical realm of thought, personality, in that you have got the same situation that people have an exaggerated sense of who they are. I don't mean individually, but as a human. That I can feel different ways. I can have different thoughts. I, I'm a complex kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, you got two, maybe three chords. And of course, if they could hear me any further, they would go, yeah, but I don't play them at the same time. And then I would say, if I wanted to waste my time, I'd say, that's it. And you go, what? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, as I was saying, it was not a sermon to try and convince you that I was to make you believe that what I was saying is correct. It's in you that you continue to deal around and you believe that you're more complex than you are. And the usefulness of this is not for you to find out I was correct. The usefulness is to find out how useless the feelings that you are involved with some kind of struggle. That sometimes you feel E flat, you call it something else. And then a lot of times, though, you feel like a, I'm talking about a real strong A-flat minor. <laughs> and you don't like it. You don't believe that you should feel that way. And so you're trying to deal with it. It's useless. And you think that it's some great change. And your own intelligence tells you, well, it is. Because when I'm in mode one, when I'm in E-flat, I'm just as sweet, I'm nice to people, Many people, I can tell they like me. People think highly of me. But I get into that dark mood, and I fall into those kind of minor keys, and I'm not fit to be around. And i got to do something about that. You have an exaggerated sense of range that you think you're much more complex than you are. You're nothing. You're blood and guts. There's a range of one or two chords, and that's it. They just happen at different times, and your feel is. Everybody's feel is that I am a complex kind of guy or gal, and you're no such thing. You're simple. You will survive. That kind of intelligence will survive. But it will not flourish. That kind of complexity is where I started tonight, if you recall. I can almost, with some validity to it, some useful validity, if you can follow it, point out that the words are almost in reality, their own opposite from in the city to where I'm talking about. The people believe that they're complex because of this exaggerated sense of range that they have, and they have no such range. They just got these one or two chords that they play over and over and over and over and over until they die. That is being simple. That is not being complex. That is simply being what you are, and you've got no future. That is, there is no change going to happen. Everything for the rest of your life will remain just as it is, including your belief that you have this great range, that you are complex, and you're not. Only the complex can be simple. Or if you want another way, only those who are consciously simple can be complex. But then, it doesn't appear to be complex. And on that lucid note, <laughs>